Hi there, this is Pastor Chris from Glory Baptist Church, and we had a bit of a recording snafu. Our camcorder shut off in the middle of our sermon this past Sunday, so I will re-record that second half or so here, so you'll see uh, in the middle there'll be a break and you'll see this added in. So, thanks for watching, hope it's a blessing. There's much for us to lift up, and prayer is certainly about giving thanks as well. Um, so I'll start with the Thanksgiving. Um, I'm going to be talking about Thanksgiving. My first Thanksgiving today is, you know, I'd, I'd announced a few weeks ago, my goal is to lose 100 pounds, you know, at least. And the scary part with that is, I'm still a big guy after I lose 100 pounds, but I'm, I'm, I'm past 10% already, so things are progressing. You, you can't tell, because 10% of me is, you just can't see it, right? But I'll take what I can get, so... Um, I'd, I'd be further along, but food is good. Man. And speaking of food, Thanksgiving is my second favorite holiday. Easter's my first. I, I'm a pastor. Easter's like the Super Bowl. I love Easter. Thanksgiving's a close number two, though, okay? I, I love Thanksgiving. And, and it has something to do with, of course, you know, the turkey. I don't like stuffing. I'm just not a stuffing guy, but turkey and more turkey and, and, and a side of turkey with my turkey and, and some corn and some potatoes and if you've never had it, chocolate pecan pie. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. If you've not had it, look it up. I'm not kidding. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those you can have a slice once a year, otherwise you will give yourself diabetes. It's that sweet, and it's that good, and it runs in my family, so I've got to be careful. So, it's good stuff. But, you know, it has more to do with, uh, I mean, I enjoy that, and I enjoy the football, of course, yeah, I love football. But it has more to do with, actually, the, the background story of the Pilgrim people. Now, many of you know, but not all of you necessarily know, I, uh, my first call as a senior pastor was a congregational church, and uh, a, a national association, a congregational Christian church. And if you don't know about the Congregationalists, they are the Pilgrim people. So when I was hired by that church, I'm not Congregationalist by background, I'm, well, I grew up Lutheran, but I consider myself a Converged Baptist as my home, and that's my theology. And, and so when they hired me, I was kind of a fish out of water there, and so they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to send you to Boston, which is like the epicenter of pilgrims, right? We're going to send you to Boston, and you're going to spend a week there studying at a seminary-level intensive course the history of congregationalism and their polity. So I, I went out to Boston, spent a week at the Congregational Library, and, and studied and studied and studied and learned and read. And, and, and seriously, I had a stack of books that they made me read that, that was at least two and a half feet thick, thousands of pages studying this history. And, and congregationalism got its foundational start on the Mayflower. You know, when the Mayflower came over, before they got off the boat, they signed the Mayflower Compact saying, when we get off this boat here at Plymouth Rock, this is how we are going to live. And this is how we are going to do business with one another. This is how we're going to do church with one another and all those sorts of things. And so that was kind of the, the culmination, the foundation of congregationalism. And so uh, after I spent that week there, that meaning behind Thanksgiving grew, you know. So I find that story inspiring, in fact, that this, this group of people who had been living in England um, decided, because of the persecution that they were experiencing because of their beliefs, they were Christians, and, and they were they were separatists. They were dissenters. They didn't agree with what the King of England had done on many levels, separating from both the Catholic Church, but also where the church was going. And so they were, in a sense, rebels. And as rebels, kings don't like dissenters. And so they were fairly per harshly persecuted. And so what they did is they decided to pack everything up, leave behind what they couldn't pack, leave family, leave friends, leave businesses, leave farms, and all those kinds of things, and set sail for the new world. And when they get to Plymouth Rock, they face incredible hardship, right? If you remember your story, um, the Thanksgiving story, the Charlie Brown one, mm, kind of touches on it, but it doesn't really get into it, and that's the one we're mostly familiar with, right? Because Charlie Brown, Charles Schultz, and Minnesota, and all that. But uh, they face this incredible hardship in that first year, just tremendously struggled with the weather, disease, pestilence, crops that weren't doing well. 
And what inspires me about their story is this incredible hard work that they had to put in in order to survive in this new land. But the other part that really inspires me is the generosity of the Native Americans who in many ways were the salvation of those first pilgrims. But what really, really inspires me, as I was saying, is what caused them to leave England in the first place. A vision. The pilgrims, you see, they had a vision of what it would be like to live in freedom. They wanted to worship and live freely. And it was this vision of freedom and this idea that they could go and express their faith freely that moved them to give up everything that they were familiar with, the comfort of their homes, their families, the assurance of food and crops that would grow, the safety of living in a country that had an army, had a navy, had protection. Give all of that up and set sail for the new world. And why I like their story so much is because they, as I read through it, help us personally examine what is it in this world that we would be willing to give up if we had a similar, clear, and compelling vision. Whether it is our time, our money, our energy, our possessions, or even life itself, we will give, give generously when we have a strong and clear vision. So today I want to look at three different biblical stories where vision helped people to give. Now, I've been talking about this before. I've mentioned this each week and I'll mention it again. I'm talking about this after the offering, right? We're not going to take a second offering. I'm not asking you to give more money. This isn't about what you're giving today. This is about heart change and a lifestyle of generosity. This is about being generous in so many categories, not just money. One of the greatest places I want everyone to learn to be generous in is be generous to forgive. As I've said before, how many people want people to show up at their funeral and talk about their stamp collection after they've passed, right? You want them to talk about, yeah, maybe you had a cool hot rod or a nice car or a neat truck or a fancy lawn mowing tractor, right? You want them to sit there talking about that though at your funeral? Or would you rather them say, you know, I screwed up this one time, bad. And Bill, despite not needing to, forgave me. And it impacted me in a way that I learned how to forgive others because he forgave me. Right? That's the kind of stuff I want people talking about at my funeral. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be known as being generous in forgiveness than known for the junk I collected. So we're talking about generosity as a lifestyle, not what you're giving in the offering. I mean, that's part of it. But it's so much more than just that. And when we have this clear vision, we can give generously. So, as I said, I want to talk about these three stories. And, and I want you to see this clearly, that I'm talking about what God helps us see in faith. Not just simply on a day-to-day -day basis and what you see in front of you, but faith. We have to have faith when it comes to our vision. Vision is seeing the better future that God desires for us. That he has in store for us if we will be faithful. Okay? And there's several ways God can help us see this. Now the first story I want to talk about today is, is a story about a man who, who gave pretty much what he had to solve a problem. Um, a problem he saw in the, in the lives of some of those he was concerned about. Uh, and he had the opportunity to make a difference. The second story is a story about a man um, in, in his life and, and where he was able to make a difference in the world. And then the third story is, is a story um, where he gets to help bring hope and salvation into the world. And all three of these stories, however, it's, it's just a great set of stories to kick us off here. And in all three of these stories, I like them all, but my favorite is this first one we're going to talk about. And this first story is about an Old Testament guy, a guy by the name of Nehemiah. You almost can't talk about vision, in fact, unless you bring Nehemiah into the story. Now let me give you a little background, and then we'll get into the scripture here. In 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, the Babylonians were oftentimes the bad guys in that time. And the temple was destroyed and, and the walls of Ju Jerusalem had been torn down. And along with this, I mean that's tragedy in and of itself, but along with this, most of the Jewish people had been carried off in chains and had been living in captivity. 
Now about 50 years following this calamity, um, the Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Persians. And then in 516, 70 years later, we find in scripture that the temple is still laying in ruins. They had not rebuilt anything. The people of Israel had not yet been allowed to return and be freed. And so it's a mess. Israel is just disjointed, broken up. They're spread all over. They're in captivity. Jerusalem and the temple are laying in ruins. There's nothing in Jerusalem to give God's people the protection that Jerusalem was supposed to give them. And so 70 years this had been going on. Okay. Now comes the time of Artaxerxes. He's the king of Persia. And as we get into the story, we find Nehemiah is his cupbearer. Now Nehemiah, we find out, is from a Jewish family. And he'd been living in Persia since the fall of Jerusalem. And when he had heard that the city of Jerusalem had been laying in ruins still, that the wall had not yet been rebuilt, it broke Nehemiah's heart. So if you want to follow along, we're going to be Nehemiah 1, verses 2 through 4 to start off with. Nehemiah 1, 2 through 4, and it says this. Hanani, one of my brothers, this is Nehemiah speaking, so he says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. Verse 3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who have survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. And Nehemiah says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You see, Nehemiah saw a problem. It was a disgrace that the city of God to be lying in ruins, unprotected. And he had a vision that stirred his heart. Nehemiah wanted to do something to solve the problem, so he began to give. What did Nehemiah give? He started by giving his time in prayer, it tells us. And then, through prayer, God gave him a faith that something could indeed be done about it. And he gave him that idea that a solution could be found. So Nehemiah then leads a group of people to Jerusalem where they begin to rebuild the walls. And because of his special position as a cupbearer to the king, Nehemiah was able to ask the king himself for some help. I mean, if you want some help, the king of Persia is a pretty good guy to have on your side back in your work, right? And so Nehemiah goes to the king. And when he talks to the king, the king is moved by Nehemiah's passion, by Nehemiah's vision. And he's moved so much by it, not only does he give him permission to go off and work, but the king says, I'll even foot the bill. I'll even fund it for you so that you can go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You see, sometimes it's the problem that we see that causes us to give. Here's another example. Someone at Glory, a number of years ago, recognized that there was a a spiritual need in our community, in our region, a need to share the gospel with students. So from there comes things like our Wednesday night programming where we have a kids club here where parents and adults from our church help grow kids in the Lord. Someone had the vision and said, we need a youth pastor. Okay, and that leads to having guys like Kevin who's doing great work with our students sharing the gospel, right? Impacting kids who might not ever come to church on a Sunday morning here, but they are here regularly on Wednesday night. And he presents the gospel. I've heard him. He brings it. Okay? So somebody had the vision and saw the need in our region, in our community, for us to impact the kids of our region. Some of whom may never come to our church otherwise. Someone saw that there was a darkness that needed light and then stepped forward in faith and began what became those programs that we have today. The same can be said for our VBS program. I was talking it up just a few minutes ago. Most of the students, most of the families that we serve, in fact, my wife and I just spent a handful of hours yesterday with one of those very families. They they go to another church in another town, not too far from here, but they'll be here for our VBS. Our VBS is so good, even though they go to another church, they volunteer here at our VBS, right? Because they know it. 
matters. They know it makes a difference. And so the work that we're doing matters. The work that we are doing makes a difference. That you would buy us a can of spray foam can have a spiritual impact. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Maybe not all of us are comfortable just walking up to a stranger and saying, let me tell you about Jesus, right? But I think most of us are comfortable to walk into Heightening and buying a can of spray foam, right? Now, we should all get better at sharing the gospel, too. There's got to be a bit of both. But we can make a difference. We are making a difference. We choose to invest, even though we may not ever see those families come here. Our goal is not necessarily as simple as bringing those families in. Yes, we want to bring those families in. I look forward to the day where we have no empty seats and we've got to figure out the problem, right? When your kids, when your grandkids, when our neighbor kids, when people we don't even know yet are here. And we've got a whole new set of problems we've got to figure out. I look forward to that day and I hope you do too. And I'm working towards that day and I hope you are too. Investing, inviting in others. Because sharing the gospel is important. We've been given by God this wonderful facility, right? And I've been given by God all of you wonderful people. And we together are responsible to use all of this to his glory and his fame, right? I mean, I see the problems in this world. I hope you do too. I see the problems. We were just talking about this this week. The problems of this world. The mess. Just stuff that is not the way it's supposed to be, right? Stuff that breaks God's heart and should make us weep. I see that in the world, but it's not just in the world. I see that right here in our community. Poverty, addiction, abuse, all sorts of other things. People who are desperate to hear and come into relationship with Jesus. And folks, I tell you what, that won't happen unless we choose intentionally to do things like our youth program. And that won't happen unless we do things just like our youth programming that creates opportunities for us to share the life and eternity changing gospel. Amazing things can happen here at Glory Baptist Church. Life changing and in fact life giving things. And because of that, we support these programs and events because we indeed can make a difference. A kingdom impacting difference. We have a vision in our hearts to help those families and students to grow in faith. While we might not see each individual victory, we can know that at times that by giving our money, by giving our time, by giving our faith, our prayers, by giving our support, we can be part of the solution. Now it wasn't until someone told Nehemiah about the situation in Jerusalem that, that he saw the problem. Sometimes we don't see great problems that are around us until someone tells us about it. So let me share with you a problem. You know in our county here in Aiken County, here in Minnesota, that the number of people who claim to be non-religious is growing. The number of people who claim no faith at all is growing. The segment that is often called the nuns and the duns, meaning they have no affiliation with the church or they're done being affiliated with the church. That is growing, whereas the number of regular church attendance people has stayed fairly static. Worship attendance overall, though, is declining. And that's happening in many churches throughout our region. And the question is, are we willing to open our eyes and our hearts and see this as a problem? Like Nehemiah, the problem can lead to a vision just, and then we can solve it, but only can this happen if we are willing to give. The first thing that Nehemiah did was he prayed. He prayed and so maybe we need to start praying and just asking God to show us how can we be part of solving this problem. Because problems can lead to a vision of solving the problem which in turn can lead us to give. Now the second story about how vision moves us and energizes us, um, <coughs> excuse me, and, and how it energizes us, <coughs> excuse me, 
The second story about how vision moves us and energizes us to give is about a tax collector named Zacchaeus. Now, if you grew up going to church or if you were in VBS as a kid, you know that Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Um, and he was short. I mean, that's what we know about Zacchaeus. Yet, he wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed up in a tree to watch Jesus as he passed by. This comes from Luke 19, 1 through 10. Luke 19, 1 through 10. There it reads, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see Jesus, who was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, and these were the people surrounding following Jesus, the religious people of the day, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now what happened to Zacchaeus during dinner that, that caused him to, that moved him to give away half of his possessions and pay back anyone who he had cheated? What happened? What happened was he got a vision of God's kingdom. Just by going to Zacchaeus' home, Jesus made a statement about who Zacchaeus was. He wasn't a hated tax collector who had no place in God's family and no part in God's kingdom. That isn't what was going to define him. Zacchaeus was a child of Abraham. Jesus opened Zacchaeus' eyes and the eyes of his heart to see the full God-given potential of what his life could be and what the kingdom of God was all about. Zacchaeus could now see the life that God wanted us to live is lived and filled with acceptance. It comes with forgiveness. And that all we need to do is to live within that acceptance and forgiveness to make things right. It was this vision that moved Zacchaeus to seek forgiveness and to offer restitution. It was a vision of God's kingdom and the potential of the new life that was so compelling to Zacchaeus that he willingly gave all that he had to see it become a reality. Seeing the potential that God has for us and for our world can move us to give, knowing that we are making a difference. It is one of the reasons, in fact, why we as a church regularly will bring in missionaries. We bring missionaries from different points across the globe, from throughout the world, some some from America even, but We've, in the last year, had missionaries um, from Malaysia, from the Twin Cities, from um, portions of the world where we can't even say our missionaries' names for fear of people finding out that they're missionaries and uh, they could potentially be jailed and or killed for the work that they're doing. And so we bring these missionaries in so we can hear their stories firsthand. That way we get reports of why our support to them matters. and where it is going and how it is making a difference. And I love that we get to do that. But we all also need to take on some personal mission and some personal evangelism to go along with that as well. We all need to be involved locally with something that makes a difference in our community. It's great to support our church. It's fantastic to support our missionaries. But I believe that God has equipped and gifted us as a church and as individuals to do so much more than just that. In fact, as I contended two weeks ago, I fully believe that if you aren't serving others, you are literally missing out on a portion of God's intended blessing for you. Serving and giving to others yields tremendous blessing. And as we do that, we get to be ambassadors of Christ 
to the very people we are serving. We know that what we do in Jesus' name can and will change people. It'll change people in our community and in our world. And it'll do it through our giving and our service and our love. And by doing that, we make the potential of God's kingdom become a reality. We forgive people, and in that, we then ask people for forgiveness. Because we see the potential of what forgiveness can do in our families, and in our church, and in our community. We work to help people, and to offer hope to people, because of the potential power that brings into our world. Jesus was the master at helping people see the kingdom of God and getting people excited about this vision so that they would willingly give of themselves. And they would give themselves to it. Zacchaeus gave away most of his money to help make things right in his life and because it was what the kingdom of God was all about. The disciples, they gave away jobs. They gave away careers. They they didn't abandon, but they had to leave their family because they saw greater potential in following Jesus. They found more personal satisfaction for their own lives in following Jesus, so they gave. When we have a vision of what it is that God can do in us and through us and with us, it will move us to give and to give generously. I get excited when I think about the potential of Glory Baptist Church. When, when I look at what our church has done in the past and the potential of what God can do through us in the future, it motivates me to give, to love, to serve. We can build a school in Kenya and help faith grow there as we have. We can also spread the gospel right here in Aiken as we encourage our brothers and sisters to do the very same thing on the far side of the globe. We can change the heart of a child through shoeboxes that we pack, that we send off into the world. Those are wonderful. But we can also feed our community through the community meal. And in that, can live more fully and give more generously. And we can do all of this because we have a vision of what God can do in us. And because of that, we can see God's potential. So the vision, of, the vision of a problem, or the vision of God's potential, can cause us to give. But there's also a third element. Sometimes it's a person who actually inspires us or causes us to give. And this was the case of a man named Thomas. Now Thomas was a disciple who was not in the upper room when Jesus first appeared after his resurrection. All the rest of the disciples got to see Jesus alive and standing right in front of them. And, and when that experience happened, that vision changed them. But you see, Thomas didn't get to see Jesus alive at that time with the other disciples. So he didn't believe that it was true. Now, a week later, Jesus appeared again, and this time Thomas was there. And the vision of the risen Jesus forever changed Thomas. John 20, 26-28 says this. Eight days later, Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. The vision of Jesus changed Thomas forever, and it moved him to give all that he had to give. It is believed that Thomas left this encounter with Jesus and at some point traveled to the east, all the way in fact to India, where he shared with the people his vision of the risen Jesus. Thomas called the people there, called them to place their love and faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and God. And many did. And then generations later, when missionaries finally arrived again in India, they were surprised to find Christians who knew about Jesus and who knew about a man named Thomas. This man 
who had shared with them his vision of the risen Son of God. So the person of Jesus changed Thomas. When we get a clear vision of Jesus, it changes everything. While it's unlikely for us that we'll probably never get the chance like Thomas to physically see Jesus standing there in front of us, at least not while we're here on earth anyhow, we can still see him in faith and trust. Because look at what Jesus says to Thomas there at the end of the story. This comes from John 20, 29. And Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet who believe. See, we don't physically see Jesus, but we can still have a vision of this person that can change us, that can excite us, that can cause us and inspire us to give. When we see Jesus in the scriptures and the potential that God has shown us, it will change us and move us to give in ways we would have never thought of before. We would never believe that we possibly could. Everyone who encountered the person of Jesus gave. It started at the manger where the shepherds gave their praise. It ended after the resurrection where Thomas gave his future to God. We can have an incredible vision, a vision of Jesus who will move us to give and give all that we have now, without a vision of who God is, what God is doing, and what God wants us to do in this world, and in the world around us, we might give some, but we won't give all. Generosity comes with a vision. Inspiration comes with a clear and compelling vision. Giving requires vision, and what can move us to give is seeing problems, seeing potential, and seeing the person of Jesus. It is my prayer that God would open our eyes and open the eyes of our hearts so that all of us may see Jesus and the potential of God's kingdom in our lives, that we might partner with God for amazing and tremendous and awesome and incredible things by being generous with all the things He has entrusted us with. Thank you, and amen.